Okay. Going to be starting uh, momentarily. I'm hoping that this uh, connection will stay up. It's snowing heavily right now here, so sometimes that interferes with the satellite signal. So if it suddenly freezes or drops out, you know what the reason. Okay. Got a few people coming in. Hello, everybody. Uh, someone's asked where I'm where I'm at. I I'm uh, located in uh, Ontario near Thunder Bay. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa <coughs> Okay so this is the fourth talk in this sequence on the, uh, the aggregates and uh, today we're dealing with sankaras uh, mental formations is the usual English uh, translation. Uh, Sankara is um, a word in Pali that has uh, some different uh, connotations according to context. The broadest meaning of Sankara uh, is uh, all compounded things. This is essentially the breakdown of the word sankara. It means something built up, something made from the, the root karoti to, to make or construct. So everything that exists except for nibbana is, is a sankara. So this is an extremely broad uh, application of the word and it points to the conditioned nature of all phenomena. Nothing exists uh, on its own power. Everything exists as a result of other, other factors, other forces, other, um, uh, other objects. So nothing exists independently or uh, is able to maintain its existence independently. Uh, there is a there are two uses of sankara, the word sankara in the, the suttas that refer to a narrower range. Uh, one is the use in the dependent origination. The um, second nidana in the dependent origination are sankara, are sankaras, because of ignorance, sankaras. And here it's defined as comically effective uh volitional actions well, those mental formations which are comically active that's the a rather narrow application but this is like one class of sankaras that's being referenced here uh, in the five aggregates that we're concerned with today um sankaras are referring to uh mental formations so the bodily objects, the, the, the physical body and matter, <clears throat> they're sankaras in the broader sense, but uh, in terms of the five aggregates, we're excluding them from sankaras. We're just talking about mental constructions. So there are altogether four aggregates that, that are classed as, as mental. And we've already discussed feelings and perception and we have vijnana or consciousness yet to come. That's the last talk in the series. Uh, so this refers to a broad range. Sankaras refers to a broad range of mental phenomena, uh, such as thought, emotions, uh, memories, anything constructed in the mind. That from the point of view of uh, citta, the knowing mind, these are all objects of consciousness. Uh, 
In the Abhidhamma, the uh, description of the components of a human being are broken down somewhat differently than the scheme of the five aggregates. Um, there are four basic realities in Abhidhamma. There's uh, the uh, rupa, which in terms of a person or a human is the body. Uh, rupa chitta, which is the knowing mind, which we'll discuss in some detail next week, but it roughly corresponds to vijnana, the fifth aggregate. Uh, and the third, the third is chitasaka or mental concomitants. Uh, it's kind of a tongue twisting word, but um, it's the the standard translation. It means those mental phenomena that can be classed as objects of consciousness. So you have the the breakdown in Abhidhamma is between the knowing and the known, subjective and objective. And the fourth category is nibbana, which is outside of the five aggregates altogether. So chitasaka in Abhidhamma covers Vedana, um, Sanya, and Sankara. And there's a list in Abhidhamma of 50 uh, mental form or 50 chitasakas, two of which are Vedana and Sanya, and the, the remaining 48 are specific. Sankaras. Now, in the original Abhidhamma, as in the, the uh, Dhamma Sangani, uh, the list is shorter. I forget exactly how many. I think it's something like uh, 35 uh, Sankaras. And it ends with a Pali phrase that means something like etc. It says, or whatever other states may arise at this time. So the original Abhidhamma left that category open-ended to just refer to all mental formations and uh, listed the um, some examples, probably the, the most important examples. Uh, later, as in the Vasudhimaga and later texts, they uh, added additional uh, sankaras to the list and basically closed the list saying oh this is a list of all the sankaras <clears throat> and i think the intention of the original abhidhamma makes uh, more sense in a way not to close the list because uh, the actual experience of what can be constructed by the mind is uh, very open-ended the mind can construct all kinds of, of objects so there are different, um, now again, referring to Abhidhamma, there are breakdowns of these Sankaras into different categories. And the most important um, would be the what are called the universals. These are seven states that occur in every uh, moment of consciousness, seven Sankaras that always arise. And these are uh, uh, contact, contact, pasa, feeling, vedana, perception, sanya. So those aren't sankaras in the um, uh, in, in the system of the five khandas. Volition, chetana, uh, one pointedness, um, uh, life faculty, and attention. So in any single moment, uh, consciousness is taking an object and it requires all these seven factors to, to operate. So there's there's uh, one point in this, ekagata, which is a, a jhana factor. And again, it's, it's the use of this word is somewhat different in terms of the jhanas, but it has the same underlying meaning. Uh, if in a single moment of time, the mind is focused on a single object. It's one of the principles of Abhidhamma. We'd never take two objects simultaneously. 
So uh, when you think you're seeing and hearing at the same time, like, uh, like if you're watching this video, you're seeing my face and you're hearing my words, what's actually happening is that your consciousness is uh, f flitting back and forth very quickly between eye consciousness and ear consciousness. But in any single moment of mind, you're only seeing or hearing. Um, this is very similar to how a standard computer works, by the way, that when you're multitasking on a computer, it's, the computer seems to be doing two things at once. It's actually going back and forth, uh, processing the, the um, different processes separately. <clears throat> Uh, so contact pasa is the um, the act of contacting the object. Adimoka is the act of turning the attention towards the object, and so on. So these are all required in each moment for taking an object. These seven. But then there's many other uh, sankars that can arise that sometimes arise. Um, Some of these are classified as skillful or kusala, leading to good karmic results or occurring in, in mind moments that are, are positive, and other ones are negative. <clears throat> so I'm just looking at the list here. So um, the unwholesome factors would include delusion, shamelessness, fearlessness of, of wrongdoing, restlessness, uh, greed, wrong view, conceit, hatred, etc. There's several more. The positive ones, uh, which are called the beautiful factors, faith, mindfulness, shame, fear of wrongdoing, that's Siri and Otapa, non-greed, not hate, hatred, uh, neutrality, uh, and so forth. And there's many more of those. Uh, so many of the, uh, the, the factors that we see come up in the various lists, the, the, the five faculties, the seven bojangas, the five uh, hindrances and so on. Most of these are uh, sankharas. Uh, an important um, the particular category of sankhara are, are uh, vitaka and vichara, which are also again uh, jhana factors. Vitaka is the initial application of mind, and Vichara is the uh, sustained application of mind. Uh, together, these represent the energies that uh, are used by the mind to manipulate objects. And they they uh, are turned to the, in, in First Jhana, they're turned to the task of uh, maintaining uh, a focused attention on the object. But the same energy, when it's not focused on a single object, the ordinary use of these, these energies, with Taka and Wachara, is to manipulate thought forms. So uh, what we call thought or thinking is the workings of Wittaka and Wachara, and manipulating objects in the mind. And they, they're also behind the expression of those thoughts in speech. It's required to manipulate uh, thoughts to produce speech. <clears throat> now, there's always some uh, degree of volition or intention behind thinking. Uh, so there is some karma attached to thinking. Now, this is something to, to, to understand. In fact, all in the last analysis, all karma is made in the mind because uh, it's only volitional actions that, that um, produce karma. And if you're going to perform any action, whether it's a skillful action leading to good result or a bad action leading to bad result, it first has to arise with an intention in the mind before the body acts. And the, the kama is made in the mind 
with the arising of intention. So these are the volitional sankaras that uh, we spoke about in, in reference to dependent origination, the second nidana of dependent origination. Um, now getting back to thought, thinking, which is the uh, one of the primary or probably the primary you know, way we experience in cars is is, um, is the the process of thinking. Uh, every anyone who has taken up meditation will have experienced the out of control thinking that uh, sometimes called monkey mind, the mind jumping around from one daydream to a memory to a uh, anxiety to. You know, to from one thing to another, seemingly uh, out of control. Uh, it is possible to rein that in and to discipline the mind. And this is part of the task of, of uh, self-development of bhavana. It's said that a, an arahant is one who has, one of these, these characteristics is he has complete control of his mental pathways. He only thinks when and what he wants to think and not otherwise. For the rest of us who are not fully enlightened, the process of thinking is more or less uh, difficult to control. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not entirely, it's not ever entirely uh, independent of our, our intention or our will. There is some... Uh, impulse behind thinking it is possible in meditation to uh, become aware of the intention to think uh, this is why it's often emphasized to uh, meditators that a teacher will emphasize that they should pay real close attention to their intentions uh, beginning with bodily intentions, like the intention to move the limbs, one should be aware of that very clearly. And there's oh, and notice that there's always an intention arising first before the body moves. And if one gets very good at noticing intentions in general, then there can come a point where you notice the intention to think. And at that point, it's like the very beginning of a thought process there is not yet any content to the thought. You're not thinking about anything, but there's a kind of a, a jelling or a congealing in the mind as it begins to gather towards the process of thinking. And if that's noticed quickly, then uh, one can stop it, make an end to it right then and there. And the mind can become very, very quiet. You know, it's uh, possible to, to see that. For a beginning meditator, someone who's just taking it up, one of the one of the important things to notice early on is the the space between thoughts. Uh, many people who have not examined their their own minds assume implicitly that thinking is the same as as consciousness, and there's even I think an explicit expression of this in such. Uh, uh, ph philosophical ideas like uh, René Descartes, who said, uh, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum, that, that uh, is to a, a Buddhist analysis that cogito is a, uh, a jumping to conclusions. You know, there, there is thought, René Descartes notices thought. Uh, that does not mean that that there's any I that's doing the thinking. It just means that thought exists and there's an awareness of thought. <clears throat> uh, thought also has the tendency, which uh, I'm sure many of you will have seen in meditation, the tendency to proliferate. Uh, this is called in Pali a papancha, that thoughts can build on thoughts and, 
and so on, on and on, and and uh, become very multi-layered and complex, and it's seeming seemingly very difficult to uh, escape from. Um, and and this this tendency is to be observed and uh, uh, not surrendered to to you know, to break to not to not to try and train the mind not to to go off into these try and train the mind not to to go off into these um, construction of elaborate uh, constructions, which is the literal meaning of sankara, building up reconstructions. Uh, one one uh, exercise you can do if you find the mind running off uh, down one of these pathways, it, uh, it, once you're conscious of that, that you've gone off the rails, try and retrospectively trace back, you know, okay, I'm thinking about this. Where did that come from? Well, before that, I was thinking about something else and then something else and try and trace it back to where you first broke from the meditation and what often maybe most of the time certainly maybe all of the time uh you'll find that there was some external sense impression that triggered the, the first train of thought it might be a sound might be a, a feeling in the body might be a smell you know, some external trigger that might be very very uh, insignificant in itself it causes the mind to go into a thought and then that thought leads to another and another until uh, the uh, the track of the meditation is forgotten and lost altogether <clears throat> another category of phenomena we could class under Sankara broadly is our emotions. Uh, this is kind of an interesting um, uh, category to consider because the word emotion <clears throat> is an English word. We have a specific meaning for it. There's a category, <clears throat> excuse me, categories of mental phenomena that we class as emotions. But there's really no word in Pali that corresponds exactly to emotion, and this is actually true for um, uh, several uh, several languages. Uh, that there's no word that really corresponds to that category word emotions. Pali will have words for all the specific emotions like love, <coughs> hatred, jealousy, anger. You know, anything, any specific emotion. But it's not a category uh, that they were really aware of. Any particular emotion that we look at, we'll see uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it tends to be rather complex. <coughs> <coughs> There's usually an underlying... Uh, uh, vedana involved that you know if we find something pleasant you know, that's vedana but then if if we uh, develop a great attachment to it and a liking and even a feeling of love or affection you now that's much more complex than just vedana that's uh, sankara is becoming involved the various uh, constructions of the mind are layered onto that initial kernel of, of vedana and it becomes a, a, a complex of emotions. And we also can see in, um, if, we're, if we're meditating and examining our states of body and mind, we can see that many emotions will also have associated uh, reactions in the body. Now, if one uh, is feeling fear or anxiety, there might be a tightening in the body. Um, and 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 so on. There's often a, an associated bodily feeling. Uh, I think it's uh, important when uh, we're trying to 
develop uh, Vipassana, we're trying to get a clear understanding by direct observation of, of what's happening in mind and body, that we try and separate these different phenomena. As it says in the Satipatthana Sutta, when observing the body, just observe the body in the body. When observing the feelings, just observe feelings. So, so you don't, you want to get beyond just seeing a big undifferentiated mass of, of stuff. Uh, you want to break it down and see what component is, is uh, bodily sensation, what component is um, vedana or feeling, and what component is uh, sankaras or mental formations. Uh, and perception you know, gets in there too, because uh, you know if we have um, either a, a great liking for something or we have a fear of something that's partly based on our or largely based on our perception of it. Okay? So all these things are components, and a, a skillful meditator will discern the initial components and not just be aware of a generalized mass, you know, and that way you'll break them up and understand them. <clears throat> so this fourth category of uh, aggregates and karas, um, there can be a, a, a tendency to just see this as sort of the miscellaneous category, but it's, it's not really that, it's specifically defined. Although it is, it's so varied. There's so many different types of sankaras, but it it means those things which are constructed and built by the mind. You know, that, and uh, also it means um, the objective part of mental life. And we'll talk about this more next week when we're dealing with vinyana. But in any. Uh, moment of, of um, existence and, and consciousness, there is a subjective side and an objective side. There's my knowing and there's the known. And the known can be external, like a sight or a sound, or it can be internal, like a thought or an emotion. This is, and those are objects to chitta. Yeah. So it's important not to identify with them. You know, we can create a self around any of the aggregates. And uh, one of the places where self is often constructed is in the process of thinking. If you identify with your thinking rather than seeing thinking as an object, as a process or a phenomena that's being observed. <clears throat> so I'll stop now and uh, see about dealing with questions in the chat for a bit so far the uh, the stream is holding up uh, that's good it's still snowing outside so that's not good let me see i'm just trying to go up in the chat here okay Eventually, the Buddha laid down the life faculty. Is laying down of this faculty and ability only of a Buddha? How about for an Arahant or other Orion? Is it was in the? Is it in the power of any Pugala? Now, this is um, something the Buddha did before his uh, Parinibbana. He uh, it said he laid down the life faculty, which means he voluntarily relinquished the. Uh, the life faculty is one of the, the listed sankaras, and it's also one of the um, 22 faculties. Uh, relinquishing the life faculties, voluntarily letting that go, so uh, no longer sustaining the continuum of the, of the life and allowing the body to die. Um, it's not stated that it's only the in the power of the Buddha, but it is... And uh, or in in what degree it's um, you know, who who has the power to do this, but it's not an, something an ordinary person can do without any kind of development. I have heard um, someone who is knowledgeable knowledgeable about um, uh, yoga systems told me that in 
Uh, Hindu yoga, there is a, they speak of this, of the ability to train oneself to control the life faculty and to either extend it or release it. <sighs> Can nothingness be a cause for vitaka? Um, no, that wouldn't apply because um, nothing, nothingness, if you mean by nothingness, uh, nothingness as in the base of nothingness, um, the mind, there's no vitaka which are present in the mind then, so uh, because it's beyond fourth jhana, so uh, no, it would not that would not apply. Uh, Bhante, I'm constantly being told to avoid the Abhidhamma. What would you say to someone new to Abhidhamma? Um, I don't know, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't advise to avoid Abhidhamma, I think it's a useful study. Um, as someone new to Abhidhamma, I would say that you should um, begin by picking up this very excellent book, uh, Comprehensive Manual of Abhidhamma, uh, which is a translation of the um, uh, Abhidhamata Sangaha by Bhikkhu Bodhi, Comprehensive Manual of Abhidhamma. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi is an excellent writer. He, he translates this as a short summary of Abhidhamma that was written in the Middle Ages and Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it and adds his own commentary and explanations. So it's the, it's the most accessible entry into Abhidhamma way of thinking. Uh, after you've read that, another really excellent book is uh, it's a book called uh, uh, Theravada Abhidhamma. And um, the author is, I, I'm not sure, I can't remember. I don't want to, I've got an, uh, an idea, but I don't want to say it in case it's wrong. I can't remember the author exactly. It starts with K, uh, Theravada Abhidhamma. And I like that book because uh, he takes a historical approach in his explanations. And he he tells you, you know, this this idea was uh, in the original Abhidhamma. This was added by the commentators and so on. What do you mean control thinking like Arahant? Um, it means that the the thinking is entirely subject to to one's uh, uh, one's volition. Uh, so for an Arahant. He might choose not to think for a period of time. He doesn't have anything he needs thinking about. He just keeps his mind quiet. Then he needs to think about something to plan out his activity or to uh, decide on something. Then you know, then he'll think about that. Uh, he'll, he'll use thinking rather than just being spun around by it. Why isn't Kama included in the three characteristics? Uh, kama is not characteristic of all phenomena because uh, kama only applies to uh, conscious beings and and, uh, and then not all the time either, but only in terms of their uh, deliberate actions. So, you know, something like a, a stone or a pebble on the ground that has three characteristics, but it, it hasn't got comma, so it's not universal like the three characteristics. Can't constructions, can't perceptions be constructed in the mind as well as learning new things? Isn't perception technically a type of mental formation in that case? Uh, well, per perception is a, a sankara in the broadest sense of the meaning of sankara, but it's separate from sankara in that it's it's not something built up or constructed with some deliberation in the mind. It's it's a reaction to sense impression. It's the mind processing sense impression. So it's a very specialized mental mental process that, that's separate from uh, thinking or emoting. Uh, where is Jiva Tindria or life force located in the five aggregates? Uh, it's classed as one of the uh, Sankaras. Uh, 
Are some pains in the body just perceptions? Um, well, all pains are in a sense perceptions because there's, you know, there's the, the physical phenomena and then there's the mental processing of it and the awareness of it. But some, some pains are entirely in the mind. It's possible to have uh, sensations in the body with no real physical causality. They just uh, created by the mind entirely. You know? So there's no damage to the body, but one feels a pain. This is something that, that can uh, bother meditators. You know, that they, can, they feel various painful sensations in the body and there's no real cause for them in terms of physical causes. Okay, reading your cosmology book, could you elaborate on the part I read where it says if a lay person becomes an arahant, they must or die, die or ordain in seven days. Yeah, this is um generally stated as a rule that if a lay person becomes an arahant within seven days they'll either die or uh ordain as a bhikkhu um this is based in part on the fact that in many cases that occur in the suttas and commentaries stories about a, a lay person attaining arahantship one of those two things always happens. There's no case where it doesn't happen. Uh, but it's not, the Buddha never laid that down as an actual rule, but it does make sense in another way. In, and I don't think, so this is kind of my own interpretation, I don't think the actual act of ordination is the, the critical thing, but there must be a complete renunciation because an arahant has no more <clears throat> desire to be involved in any worldly activity so there's no impulse for an arahant to, uh, say, uh, farm the land or go get a job or uh, live, live a, keep a home or <clears throat> have a marriage. You know, not, none of those things. He has no impulses for any of those things. So he, he would have to completely renounce the world. Um, and one way of doing that is become a, become a bhikkhu. And that would be the culturally acceptable way of doing that in, in a Buddhist society. Uh, there's, a, there's a story about a, a, a lay person in, in the Buddhist time who attained arahanship. And as soon as he left, there's actually two individuals this happened to. As soon as he, he left the, uh, uh, the building and went out into the street, he was run down and killed by a mad cow. Uh, let's see. You said kama is made from intention, but Buddha says, I declare Buddha's volition is kama. So it seems they are the same thing. Uh, a chetana is the making of kama. I think you're kind of splitting hairs there, but uh, uh, volition chetana is, is, chetana is, is, is what? is the making of kama. Kama is action. You know? um, and kama has results, which is vipaka, which is something something different. Since our hands have residual vipaka and generate nukha, no, they don't generate nukama. They, uh, how do, uh, then do our hands technically have no volition? Um, they, their, um, their volition is classed separately it, in the Abhidhamma, there's a separate category that's called Kriya or effective because they're not acting out of ignorance. So they have a, a volition, but it's quite different than the volition of an unenlightened person because it's not founded on ignorance. Dhammapada says, mind precedes all things. Does that mean it precedes the five aggregates? Uh, what does this verse really mean? If dependent origination means everything arises due to causes. Uh, yeah, this is the first verse of the Dhammapada. Runner mind, uh, all things arise from mind. And I think there's different ways of reading that. One is a kind of metaphysical, um, metaphysical uh, position that, that mind is, is, 
is the fundamental reality and that, that matter really arises from mind. But it could mean on a, on a kind of more mundane level, it, it just it could mean that in human experience and our anything we do with the body first occurs in the mind that the body is entirely subject to the mind i recently contemplated the four noble truths and this thought arose is it correct to say that in order to cultivate compassion towards others it's important to remember that when experiencing someone is acting harmful this also arises as a consequence of suffering therefore should focus on that being experienced in dukkha rather than focusing on the ill deed yes that's a skillful way of thinking about it when people are acting badly you know they're not only creating suffering for others but they're creating suffering for themselves in the future and they're coming from past suffering so they're uh, without tolerating their bad deeds. Um, it, it is possible to arouse, arouse compassion for their situation. <clears throat> I find myself strongly triggered by the deed, which makes it hard for me to focus on what's going on. Yes, yeah, no, that's a that's a natural reaction, but it's something to observe and, and not to give in to. Is depression, uh, next question, different question, or is depression a vipaka from previous kama, or is it something negative we were generating this life and lead to lower rebirth in Peta realm? I think it's both. Um, everything arises from causes, and that certainly applies to mental states like depression. Um, causes in, in this life, which could be external causes, like a bad situation, uh, uh, but more importantly, internal reaction to that and the dwelling on negative thoughts can drive one down into a cycle of depression. Um, and if, if one doesn't overcome that, it could lead to uh, further down, downward cycle of consciousness and, and yeah, I think you're right. It could lead to lower rebirth in a Peter realm. Uh, are animals the dumbest beings in samsara, or are there beings like those in other realms, the Raya realm, even dumber? Uh, if by dumber you mean like low intelligence, um, it, it's hard to say. I would, I would think that. Um, my guess would be that the, the the lowest intelligence would be the lower levels of the animal realm, like like um, you know, worms and things like that, microscopic animals. In your cosmology book, you put the animal realm as being lower than the peta realm. Does this mean that animals experience more suffering than petas? Um. The reason for that ordering is that the, and it's, that's a kind of traditional ordering, is that the Peta realm is, is closer to the human realm. Um, you know, Peta's realm is very close to the human realm. They're, they're, they've just fallen out of a human condition. There's a sutta where the Buddha talks about the different realms using uh, analogies or metaphors, you know, as a traveler uh comes across the uh, a tree and he rests under the shade of a tree that's the human realm but if he comes across the shade uh, tree and he tries to rest under the shade of the tree but the tree is doesn't have many leaves and it gives poor shade and the ground underneath is hard and rocky that's like the ghost realm um the animal realm he compares to falling into a pit of filth like a garbage pile um so what's significant significant there is that of the five different realms each one has this metaphor the one for the human realm and the ghost realm are very similar it's just the uh, ghost realm being an inferior copy of the human realm so i think that's why it's placed in the order it is it's not a degree of suffering uh, the petas suffer a great deal 
and some animals suffer a great deal, but some of them don't have that that uh, overwhelming suffering either. Uh, what are beings in Arupa realm and Sudawasa called? Um, in the text, they're often they're often uh, the Sudawasa beings are often called Dewas, Sudawasa Dewas. Uh, but they're classed as being part of the the word dewa can have a very broad usage, uh, but uh, their class as being part of the the rupa bumi and the same sort of consciousness level as Brahmas. The rupa realm beings are are just called mind only beings or four aggregate beings. Uh, if your mind doesn't inhabit space, and what stops two mind streams from entering the body at birth, if their karma allows it? Uh, this is not. Uh, this doesn't really make sense because you would have to have two beings with identical karma, and there, uh, there's no such. There's no such thing. If someone thinks I am nibbana, is this a form of conceit? Yes, that would be a self-view is contemplation of mental formations mainly covered in uh, Dhammanu Pasana um, if, uh, if I'm taking you to if I understand you um, Dhammanu Pasana I think if you you mean by that um, Dhammanu uh, Sati the fourth uh, or the the fourth, yeah, the fourth uh, Satipatthana contemplation of Dhammas. Yeah, that would be that would be the Satipatthana that covers that. Uh, oh, Dhammawaro, hello. Okay, I'll take a couple more questions. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, can you talk about inducing joy in meditation? Uh, some say it arises naturally. Um, yeah, uh, <clears throat> some some meditations are particularly conducive to arousing joy, uh, such as a metta or um, contemplation of the Buddha, contemplation of devas. These kind particular kind of meditations are especially conducive for arousing joy, but joy in the form of piti and sukha will, will arise naturally with, uh, with any uh, samatha meditation, with any um, development of samadhi. Once the mind lets go of the hindrances, you know, that's this really the key is letting go of the five hindrances, and then the mind will naturally find its way there in, into... Uh, deeper samadhi and into the arising of piti and sukha. <clears throat> it seems that good karma begets more good karma and bad karma begets more bad karma. Is this true? Yeah, I think there is that that tendency there, that to get caught in a kind of a positive feedback loop. Once you start, if you start doing, if you start making good karma, you start acting in that way, then you start to feel good doing it and you'll do it more often and it becomes more of a habit you know, that uh, becomes habitual comma then but the same thing happens with bad comma you can get spiraled into more and more bad comma <clears throat> theoretically if a human had to fight a peta or naraya being who would win uh i don't think they would be any possibility of a, like a physical fight because they're the the, the Naraya beings are an entirely different plane of existence, so they wouldn't, you wouldn't encounter them. A peta is very insubstantial. So I think a physical fight is not really a possible question. Uh, are, are they physically, mentally able to dominate us? Uh, only if you let them. Um, petas or, or yakas are sometimes also said to... Uh, possess uh, a human being but it's only if you make an opening for them by uh, 
by your defilements. You know, if if you um, if you're living in an ethical way, you, you're reasonably pure in your precepts, and especially if you've got some samadhi, you'll never have to worry about uh, beings taking advantage of you in that way. Is the Buddha's virgin birth metaphorical? <clears throat> um, it's not really clear uh, from the oldest stories that the Buddha was that was in the that the Buddha was a virgin birth. Um, his birth was special in many ways, but it seems like his physical conception was probably in the ordinary way. It's not specifically stated. Uh, <clears throat> that his his mother was a virgin. She was the wife of the king. She was almost certainly not a virgin uh, at, at that time. Um, it, it is said that the Buddha entered her womb from the side as a white elephant. In the, you know, she had this vision, let's say, of, of the Buddha, of a, a white elephant entering her side in the night. Uh, <coughs> But it's not clear that that didn't involve, uh, it's not stated one way or the other whether it involved the previous intercourse with her husband. You know, biologically, the actual conception of a human being doesn't occur until some time after the, the physical act of sex. It takes some time for the, the seed to, to reach the womb. Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll call it for to today. I think we we're lucky we made it through the entire stream without uh, the signal dropping out. It's still snowing here, and uh, it's coming down pretty heavy. So I I was a bit uh, dodgy about the possibility of staying up, but it it worked. And next week we'll do the last in this sequence. Um, and a, again, a heads up that I'm going on retreat in, in April. There'll be a, a break in these talks. There won't be any YouTube streams for the month of April. I'll start again in May. Okay. <clears throat>